Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Hollinger will address one of the most important issues in this series, the repatriation of objects to their cultural origin. Dr. Hollinger is a tribal liaison for the Repatriation Office of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. This office works on repatriation of Native American, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian materials. And these include human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. Dr. Hollinger works closely with tribes from the Northeast, the Great Lakes, the Midwest, the Great Basin, California, and Alaska. Dr. Hollinger was trained as a four-field anthropologist with an emphasis on archaeology, and he has a BA and MA from the University of Missouri and a PhD from the University of Illinois. He formerly had repatriation responsibilities for the University of Illinois and at Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology before joining the Smithsonian in 2001. In addition to repatriation consultations and research, he has led the NMNH's collaborations with tribes on 3D digitization and replication of objects. And at the end of his talk, let me encourage you to wait until you get the microphone. I'll repeat that uh, information again. We are filming this event, and so that we want to be able to get your question on film. Um, so thank you very much. Now please help me uh, in welcoming Dr. Hollinger. I'm really grateful for this exciting opportunity to share with you some of what we're doing at the Smithsonian. But I first want to acknowledge the Muncie and Delaware people whose traditional territory we're on today. And it's appropriate to start with them too because they kind of started us off on the road to 3D replication of repatriation related collections. And so it was, uh, as you'll see in the, the, what I describe here, uh, they got us going in this area and, uh, and they're still interested in, in it and doing some more with us and with other museums as well. So they kind of kicked it off, so it's good to be coming back here to Philadelphia to kind of uh, pay homage to, to them as, as kind of founders of this, of this new domain. So, as she mentioned, I'm an archeologist. I was trained as an archeologist, um, and I'm not a computer guy. So if you're interested in how the digital technology works, 3D replication, digitization, uh, I can introduce you to those people that do that for me at the Smithsonian. But uh, I definitely have come to value that technology. I wish I took more computers in, in high school because I now see what it could do and where it can take us. And so my role is really to help work with the tribes and help them meet and understand the people who can do these things for them and vice versa, help our, our IT and our digitization people and our model makers to understand the tribe's perspectives and issues and what they have to do to kind of navigate. Uh, as I said, this is a new domain for all sides. And uh, so I want to acknowledge the Smithsonian uh, institution exhibits and the digitization program office in particular that are, are two big units that, that help support us in our work. At the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian is the world's largest museum complex with uh, 19 museums and counting, uh, who knows when we're adding more, and, and research centers all over the world. Uh, last count, we had 157 million cataloged items in the Smithsonian at large, and that includes the Space Shuttle, the Hope Diamond, a flea, might be one catalog number in those, and we are adding them so fast we really can't keep track. The Natural History Museum, which is uh, the biggest collections holder, we hold about 146 million of those catalog numbers, and we hold the, old, the oldest collections of the Smithsonian, starting with the earliest collections formed in the late 1830s. Because of that, we have the largest collection of Native American items that are subject to federal repatriation le legislation and that means human remains and funerary objects, sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, um, three million objects in our anthropology department alone. So we have the biggest repatriation obligations under the laws as well. Now, with big collections, as, as uh, all museums around the country were facing with the uh, advancement of what was then called the reburial movement in the 70s and, and 1980s, Museums began to repatriate even before there was federal re legislation requiring it. And our museum was no different. We did repatriations of some sacred objects and human remains like this scene in, in 1988 well, before there was a requirement to do so. 
And then in 1989, the National Museum of the American Indian Act, which created the Museum of the American Indian, it included repatriation provisions that required the Smithsonian to undertake repatriations, consultations with tribes, sharing inventories with them of what collections we had, and to begin that process. It required repatriation consultations for human remains and funerary objects. And then the NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, was built on that and expanded to the rest of the country. So U of Penn is under NAGPRA, and every other museum in the country and every university in the country is under NAGPRA. We are exempt from NAGPRA because we already had our own law uh, that, that, that it was built on. NAGPRA added sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony as categories that can be claimed under repatriation. And in a 1996 amendment, that was uh, added to our law formally. But as a matter of policy, we adopted those categories immediately as soon as NAGPRA was passed as well. So both laws are very much parallel, and the definitions that we use for these categories of objects are the same. The repatriation process usually begins with tribes reviewing inventories that we sent to them, and then oftentimes they'll come to the museum uh, to look at the collections, to interact with the objects, to understand what we have, and um, if they feel it's appropriate, then they may submit repatriation requests. They often review the records as well, because uh, it's often important to uh, identify where they came from. And this has led to a number of repatriations. We have repatriated over 6,200 remains or offered for repatriation. Some are awaiting disposition decisions by the tribes. They've been offered and they control them essentially while they're in the museum, and they will tell us when they're ready to receive them back home. And over 220,000 objects, mostly funerary objects, an additional 55 sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony have been repatriated. In the course of these repatriations and the consultations that happen with them, more and more we're finding that tribes are coming and they don't claim collections, or they're not claiming them yet. They may one day. But more and more they're interested in learning what we have in the collections and learning from collections, records, and um, items that may not be fitting a category for repatriation. They're very excited about the museum as an archive and they're, they're diving deeper and deeper into the collections as, uh, and to revive the technology that's there. Here, a Klingit weaver, she's actually weaving patterns from our collections into her robes. That's the traditional consultation approach. Muse tribes come, they interact with the collections, they learn what's there, they may make claims. And even that is changing with the new technologies that are available to us. Now we can Skype and uh, we can do video teleconferencing with tribes. In this scene, Klingit uh, visitors are, are uh, teleconferencing with school children back in Alaska to show them in real time what we have in the collections. The young lady in the lower left in the wheelchair, she got sick during this consultation visit and had to stay at her hotel for two days and we had a laptop with her, and she was able to interact with us as if she was still there, and she was able to tell us, turn that object over, I want to see the other side. But she wasn't well enough to come to the museum. So now with this technology, we can do this with people in hospice in Alaska, in the Aleutians. In real time, they can interact with us, and they can interact with school children and teach them remotely through our collections in the museum. So we expect this will be a, an area of consultation and interaction that will only grow as the technology becomes easier and the internet capabilities become easier. The school teacher here, you see her holding up a, that's a 3D uh, or a 360 fisheye camera. She's recording everything in 360 degrees around her. And when she returned to Alaska, students put on virtual reality goggles and they were able to look around as if they were in the room with us. As I said, the traditional approach is to come and interact with the objects and most museum digitization efforts for all museums is to image the object and to put it up on the web, make it available for, for people, including tribes, to interact with, to see uh, the uh, open access as much as possible for collections. And this is often, and some people call this digital repatriation if they're, they're moving uh, records back into the tribe's hands or back into tribal access. Sometimes it may be exclusively into the tribe's hands, audio recordings uh, from archives like Tim uh, did, and uh, sharing. And this sharing has been going on since digital technology was available. CDs, thumb drives are sent to tribes. 
Now we put them on Dropbox and uh, SharePoint and things like that, and people can access them remotely and, uh, and certainly email things. Now tribes, uh, our, our CDs are now defunct. A lot of tribes we work with, they don't even have CD players anymore. They're just send me a thumb drive or put it in Dropbox and I'll get it that way. And we can have conversations like that immediately uh, interact and they can say, I need a close up of that image, turn it over and, and, and uh, that object, turn it over and get me a close up. So this is, is very common now. And the Smithsonian's efforts to digitization, the digitization program off which, which serves all 19 museums, they are overworked because they're trying to digitize as much of those 157 million objects as they can and uh, in as many ways as they can. And they're doing coral and uh, bees. They'll do 20,000 bees in one week. They can uh, mass digitization projects. But they're taking 2D images and putting them up on the web. So there is some 3D going on with that, but the digitization uh, and everything is about getting it up on the web, getting access uh, to people. What we're talking about now in, in this context is going one step beyond that. And it's a step that even the Smithsonian, our grants within the Smithsonian, haven't quite wrapped their heads around yet because we're going back to the physical world already, going back to the physical world from digital representations. And that started with uh, the Delaware and Muncie tribes, as I mentioned, with this pewter pipe. This is a Dutch-made pewter pipe. It was excavated from a Muncie grave uh, in the late 1800s, just north of here along the Delaware River. And uh, uh, three tribes, the Stockbridge Muncie of Wisconsin, the Delaware Nation, and the Delaware Tribe of Oklahoma uh, claimed this for repatriation along with human remains that we had in the museum. And we agreed to the repatriation. And one of the representatives, Sherry White from Stockbridge Muncie, had been to the museum and done some actually some osteology training with us because she wanted to learn how to identify human remains in the field when there were excavations going on. And in that context, she saw CT scanning, she saw 3D replication going on of early hominid skeletons so we could complete our exhibits. We can scan one side of the skeleton, flip it in the computer and make a 3D print of the other side so you can make a more complete skeleton. She saw that uh, being utilized by the Smithsonian and she said, you're gonna repatriate this pipe to us. This is a 13 inch uh, pewter Dutch made pipe uh, dating to the 1600s. And uh, she said, before you do that, because this is a very rare object, this is very unique, uh, we're going to rebury that. And we, we kind of don't want to lose that um, ability to teach about our material culture and to teach about repatriation, because we don't like to take pictures of repatriations, and only the people who are at the repatriation will have a memory of this. But we, we would like you to make a 3D copy of that for us to have in our tribal office. And this was very uh, late notice. We weren't sure we could do it. We said, well, we'll, we'll ask. We'll work with exhibits and see what they can do. We CT scanned it. We gave them the files and they made a 3D print of it and we rushed it to the repatriation along with the remains and the actual pipe and uh, the tribes reburied the human remains and a number of objects in Delaware Water Gap uh, National Recreation Area just north of here and 40 representatives came from all three tribes for the repatriation and here you see Sherry White holding that 3D print and about an hour after the repatriation where we signed over everything to them, they came back to us and they said, we like what you did with the print, but you didn't have time to paint it to look like the original. So we want to loan you the original back and have it, take it back to your exhibits guys and have them use that as a model to paint this so it looks more like pewter and then make two more, one for all three tribes. So we can all teach about this and teach about this repatriation that way. So that's what we did. So we made one, all three tribes have one. Uh, they allowed us to make one as well. And uh, they will repatriate, they, or they, they, they own that pipe. They will rebury it uh, along with other objects when they're ready then, but they at least can handle and they can share uh, this pipe. So they started us off on that. It's not something we would have ever considered. We would have never proposed this to a tribe. We would have assumed they wouldn't go for something like that. So she saw the technology and they had the idea to push the envelope to go farther with it than we ever would have imagined. And that's something to hold. That's the lesson from tonight is to not make assumptions about what tribes will or not be supportive of or interested in because we're going to see it in case after case after case here. Our next big project was this killer whale clan hat from Alaska. And this was collected in 1904. It uh, was used as a clan crest object. It was made in 1900. It had only been used four years before it was collected by a Smithsonian collector who brought it to the Smithsonian. Uh, where it was later found by uh, the Kilowale clan leader, the descendant of the former owner of that, this is Mark Jacobs Jr. He found it in our collections and he initiated a repatriation request for the hat. 
Now these hats, to give you some context, they're very important uh, uh, crest objects. Uh, the Klingit call them atu. It means purchased or bought objects. And uh, when they mean purchased, in the old days, they were purchased with human lives. And so uh, there might be a death of an ancestor that uh, caused them to lay claim to the killer whale as a crest. Or, and when these hats were first commissioned and brought out, uh, they were, had to be commissioned by opposites. The Klingit society is divided into two moieties. They're all ravens or eagle wolf. Uh, sometimes I might just say eagles. And uh, um, so you're either one or the other. And you marry your opposites, you ask the opposites to build your house for you, and then you pay them back later. When there's a funeral, somebody dies, the opposites come forward, they take care of the body, they put the suit on the person, they dig the grave, and then a year later or so, you hold a ceremony where you pay them off at a kuik, at a potlatch, and you pay that debt. And it maintains a balance, a kind of yin and yang within their society. You have to marry your opposites. If you don't, it's like marrying your sister. It's like incest to them. So eagles marry ravens, ravens marry eagles. And um, so these clan crests, these hats, they symbolize the, the crest. When they brought them out, uh, they had to commission an opposite to make the hat. So opposites had to make it, eagles made them for ravens and vice versa. And then they brought them out publicly in ceremony in these kuiks, like you see these gentlemen here. And you see frogs and beavers and sharks and ravens and cohos in this scene. And each one of those represents their clan uh, with these clan leaders. So, and each one has a spirit of ancestors, past, present, and future generations. Their spirits are all in these hats. So it's not just representing the ancestors, it's also future generations are in these. So their identity is wrapped up in these hats. These, you could say, are really more important to them than human remains are. Uh, we have human remains in our museum they've never claimed before, but they are interested in these hats because their, their whole identity is wrapped up in those. And when they hold ceremony, they have to have a balance between these hats because they both have to be represented there. One comes out, another one of equal prestige and status has to come out. When they first were brought out, as they say in ceremony, they sometimes would kill slaves on them to, that's what they mean by uh, um, paid for and, and, and bought. And now uh, they use blankets and money. So they talk about killing money on the hat. Instead of killing people, they kill money on the hat. And so it's not ought to unless it's gone through that process, unless it's been consecrated and dedicated in that way. Even in the late 1800s and early 1900s, is very important for the Klingit, for the opposites and others to witness their events. If it wasn't witnessed, it didn't happen. And so even things like clan leader's death was uh, witnessed. They brought objects forward, put the clan objects around the clan leader, and he was in communication with his ancestors through these objects. And so these types of objects, they clearly meet the definitions under uh, NAGPRA and the NMAI Act of sacred objects because they're traditional, they're needed by traditional religious leaders today, which are the clan leaders, they act as traditional religious leaders in these contexts of these ceremonies. And they're also objects of cultural patrimony in that they are owned by the clan as a whole or the clan house as a whole, their communal property in that sense, and their importance, they're inalienable by the individual. The individual caretaker didn't have the right to sell these if he was doing it uh, without the knowledge or consent or for the group as a whole. So, Mark had requested this hat for repatriation. We felt it met all the criteria and we repatriated it. Did I jump one slide? We agreed to the repatriation and at that time we learned that he was very ill and in the hospital in Sitka. So I rushed it to him on New Year's Day in 2005 and uh, signed it over to him in his hospital bed. That was legal under Western law. We were done as far as the museum was concerned. But for the Klingit, it wasn't done yet. Under Klingit law, it had to be witnessed by the opposites. So the next day in the hospital in Sitka, they gathered as many clan leaders as they could on uh, January 2nd. And you see here, they put the coho hat, a raven side hat. The killer whale is on the eagle side. So they brought forward a raven side hat placed next to it to balance it. And then coho clan leaders brought it forward. And as they do this, they, They'll say, uh, this is not me doing this. This is Uncle Charlie Jim. They'll invoke ancestors. So it's clearly not them doing it. They'll bring ancestors into that room and perform it with them and for them. Because uh, nothing that they do is done by these people. It's always the ancestors. It's always the spirits that are doing it. 
So they are kind of agents of these spirits in this context. And they placed it on Mark's head and they completed the, the return under Klingit law. It was finally back in the Dakloedi clan's hands, the Kilauea clan, this is the Dakloedi. Mark passed away 11 days later with the Kilauea hat on his legs, on his bed, with other uh, clan crest objects around him, so he was in communication with the ancestors at that time as these objects were uh, used for hundreds of years. So it was able to uh, serve its intended purpose once again. The hat was present at his um, funeral. You see uh, they gathered many, many hats from other clans and uh, placed them together. You see the raven side uh, objects are in the foreground there and the eagle side objects are back there with Mark on the stage in his clan house in Sitka. Two years, two and a half years later, the clan had gathered enough resources to finally hold the memorial potlatch in his honor to um, um, recognize his death and his memorial and to uh, transfer the care of uh, the clan's crest objects to new clan leaders, new caretakers. And uh, they held a potlatch or what they called a kawik, and the hat was transferred into the care of new clan leaders. Here you see Edwell John Jr., the clan leader in the center, wearing the Chilkat robe and the large, broad clan hat. And you might recognize that hat from that photo from 1900 to the clan leader. These hats, a lot of these hats, were repatriated from other museums. Uh, so when you see these on these clan leaders, many of them had been in museum or private hands and then through the repatriation process have now gotten back into use by these communities. So the killer whale hat was danced again at a potlatch for the first time in over 100 years. So Edwell John, the new clan leader uh, who had care of these objects, he was a computer guy. He understood computers, he's comfortable with computers, and he knew what we could do with uh, technology. And he asked uh, for us to scan the object, the hat, to create a digital record of it, a digital archive for security in case it was lost. Uh, the Klingit are very concerned about fires. House burns down and that's lost. What do they have to uh, hand to a carver? Maybe some two-dimensional photos and say, here, do your best. So Edwell recognized the potential for 3D documentation to uh, build on that to create an additional level of security. And so he was interested in that. And at the same time, we said, you know, we're interested in telling the stories of these repatriations. And museums, we can't usually do exhibits on repatriation because we are giving away or giving back the items, the material that we're talking about. And some are too sensitive to show photographs about. And so we, we asked, could we make a replica of this for use in an exhibit to help tell the stories of repatriation. And he said, yeah, he'd be up for that. And uh, here you see a laser scanner. You can probably make out the laser on the hat uh, moving up and down there. So this was documented with laser scanners. It was also documented with photogrammetry. And photogrammetry is where you take multiple pictures overlapping and then you use a computer to merge and overlap those into a 3D uh, object. We also used CT scans uh, of this, so we wanted to document this as thoroughly as we could using different methods. Now, once you have these in 3D uh, or in the files, they can be combined in the computer to create a point cloud. And so each of these little dots is X, Y, Z coordinate in three-dimensional space, and put together, they're a point cloud. The computer can then join those, can link, can, can connect the dots between all those, and it makes it look like a very solid object. And that's what we see here in this, is what they call polygon models. Once you have that solid object, you can put it up on the web and you can apply color and texture to it so it looks just like the real thing turning in space. Or you can 3D mill or 3D print the object. And in this case, we wanted to do it as close to the same traditional methodology as possible, so we actually got alder wood, the wood that they make the hats out of a lot of times from the Klingit, and uh, it was milled on a computer-guided milling machine. So this is now the computer using the files as a guide to shave that out of the wood. Once it was carved, then uh, uh, model makers used traditional methods to paint it using photographs. They didn't have access to the hat. This was uh, after Edwell brought it down and scanned it. He took it back and continued to use it in ceremony. So we were going just by photographs and the digital files, and the model makers inlaid shell and uh, attached ermine skins and human hair. And in 2012, it was completed, and we took it to Alaska to a clan conference and revealed it to Edwell. This is him seeing it for the first time. He's very excited. If you go online and, and uh, look up uh, Smithsonian Klingit 3D collaborations, there's an article there that has a video clip linked to it of Edwell's reaction <laughs> to it. And he gives a nice little uh, impromptu speech talking about how when he sees this hat, he sees his, his mother and his uncle. 
and his relatives that went before him. Because again, he's identifying that those crest objects as, <coughs> excuse me, as representing his ancestors. So this is not, this is not just a killer whale uh, to him, but it symbolizes his entire clan. He brought it forward and he brought forward the original hat and we put them side by side for the first time. And uh, what do you think? They look pretty similar. The original hat's a little darker because it's been handled now for a few years in uh, Klingit hands. It's gotten uh, um, a little bit of darkness and wear on it. You see it's lost four teeth. Uh, our model makers actually made an additional four teeth for the Klingit to use to repair their hat. They liked it so much they danced it uh, at uh, clan night. They uh, put it on, they danced it together with the original Dakloedi hats. And they came to DC with their dance group and they danced it there at the National Congress of American Indians inaugural powwow and in the museum at Natural History, danced these hats together. So the Edwell allows us to exhibit this and it's on permanent exhibit in the Education Center at the Natural History Museum. And one unique thing about this is in our agreement with the Klan is they have the right to check it off exhibit to dance it as regalia as they did in those other events. As far as we know, this is the first museum made object that a community treats as regalia. Uh, as part of the agreement, we also agreed that it would never cross over and be brought out and used in ceremony. So it would never become atu. So it would only be regalia. And he wanted to make sure it was clear that when it's exhibited, that we make clear that it's a replica, that it's not atu, that it's not a clan crest object, that they have the original in use in, in Alaska and is serving the community as it should, because he didn't want people to perceive that he was not fulfilling his responsibilities and Mark's intention to have that back in the community's control and in their hands. He came and spoke to our museum board at the dedication of uh, Curious, and again danced the hat in front of the museum board to show them the Klingit uh, song and dance and the, the way that uh, they use the hats. And the hat is visible uh, to you on the Smithsonian X3D website. So this is where a lot of iconic objects from around the Smithsonian have been 3D digitized. Amelia Earhart's flight suit, Abe Lincoln's death mask, the Wright Flyer, those can all be seen on this website. And you can zoom in on them and you can turn them upside down and you can see the original knife marks on the bottom of the interior of this hat. So you can see it up close. Most of those uh, 3D images, those files up there, are downloadable and printable, not this hat. Edwell wanted to make clear that that would be a violation of their cultural property rights to them. For people to uninhibited uh, be able to make 3D replicas, keychains with it, things like that. He doesn't want them to have that ability. A lot of the Klingit clan leaders, their greatest concern is that this end up being used for commercial purposes and be, uh, being used for mass production. So this is one that cannot be uh, 3D uh, printed. And we get calls from teachers in Australia saying, hey, we're printing all these in our classes, but we can't, something's wrong, we can't print that uh, killer whale hat. So we realize we, we need to add a little language on here as to why they can't <laughs> 3D print it. But you can go to this site and, and view it and zoom in on it and, and look at it up close. So they have come to DC twice now and danced it uh, for important events, the National Christmas Tree Lighting and presidential inaugurations at, at uh, different events associated with that and in the museum several times. Our next project has been with the Klingit community of Huna, Alaska. This one involves shamanic objects. So these were funerary objects that were with shamans graves around Huna. There were 53 objects in total that they claimed and uh, we agreed to the repatriation as uh, funerary objects. And these objects, uh, it's rare for the Klingit to claim these because shaman's objects they view as uh, yake, uh, a spirit in the objects that are dangerous. Only shamans could control them and, and knew how to control them. So the Klingit don't touch these objects. They, uh, when they do repatriate them, when they come out, when they're brought out and, and displayed and return home, they usually have museum people hold them up and display them for people. And they say if the museum people haven't gotten sick or died from touching these objects, they'll, they'll just let them keep handling them <laughs> for them. And uh, uh, that's fine with us. I now carry a pair of gloves with me whenever I go to Klingit events in case I'm asked to hold up something from another museum because uh, I don't know what kind of pesticides were on it or, or things like that. And they do have, they were sometimes treated with pesticides. And uh, you see the red paint in these images, that's pure mercury. They were painted with mercury. 
with vermilion and cinnabar uh, in them originally. So they have a physical hazard there, a chemical hazard that's a potential, in addition to a spiritual hazard. So uh, the village of Huna, they wanted to exercise their control over these objects, so they asserted a repatriation request for them. But they, like uh, the Delaware, felt like there was an educational value there that they didn't want their own community to miss out on. So they asked us, like the Delaware, to make 3D replicas of these so they could use to have people be able to understand the art, because some of these are in incredible uh, works of the carving, the, the skill, and to understand uh, shamanic uh, issues and, and, and practices and, and taboos of what they did and why they did things. So when we repatriated them, in 2013 in Alaska. The objects never left. They are on temporary loan to us. And the, this is on the cabinet. This is the loan agreement is actually on the cabinet in our collections to mark these as now owned by Huna and under their control. They placed no research restrictions on them. They said as far as they're concerned, if people want to come and study Klingit rattles, they can have access to these as well. But they now own them. Now, a lot of the objects that they have are not really suitable for 3D replication or not easily replicated by the technology that we were talking about, like these leather dance aprons, ponchos, and shirts. But about 33 to 36 objects are uh, three-dimensional objects like this rattle that are uh, more suited to this technology. So we CT scanned uh, objects like this rattle. We have a medical CT scanner in our anthropology department. We now have a micro CT scanner as well. This allows us to see the interior, the hollow portions of it. You can see the stone beads that were drilled. We couldn't see that from the outside, but now we can tell how many beads there are and how they're drilled. And uh, you see the red paint in the, um, on the scene of the rattle on the top there. That's mercury. That CT scanner can help us map, map the mercury on that as well. So we can learn a lot about the objects and how they're put together. Then from the digital files, this is Carolyn Tome of Exhibits. She is processing the files to prepare them. And then once the model is made, you could put it up on a website if you felt that that was an appropriate context, even one that was exclusive just to the community. And then it was 3D printed. And these 3D printers, they, you may be familiar with those printers that you see in Barnes & Noble and uh, the hardware store for $200 or things like that. They print in plastic, and, and they're, they're, they're cute. They're, they're really toys. But um, these 3D printers are a bit more sophisticated. This is, uh, has a large bed of powder. And, and essentially, an inkjet printer cartridge is moving back and forth over. Instead of laying down ink, it lays down kind of a, a resin, a bonding agent, that hardens that powder. And once it's dried and hardened, then they can lift the print. Here you see her lifting the rattle out of that bed of powder. She vacuums away the loose powder. And they can print as many as can fit in that bed of powder at a time. So they can print multiple. They can enlarge it. They can reduce it in scale. Once it's printed and it comes out, then she undertakes painting it using the original, uh, as you see in the foreground there, as the model. Here they are side by side. And you've already probably been studying this uh, uh, to get ready for the talk. But uh, the key point of this is that the 3D prints allow you to do things that you could never do with the original. And when it's culturally appropriate, people uh, go down that road. Because I couldn't do this with the original. You can hear the beads printed inside it. Now they recognize that uh, if they're teaching with a school child or something like that, let them handle that, maybe with a docent. They might drop it, they might shatter. It's expensive to reproduce, but you can replace it. Uh, the original might not be able to do that. So when they get these objects back, ultimately, they, they will put them in their cultural center once they've completed the building of that, and they might decide to sequester those objects so that people don't come in contact with them, but they'll, in a sense, have a surrogate that they can interact with and learn from. So we're CT scanning and replicating as many of these objects as we can uh, with funding jointly, some from them, some from us. Uh, they're allowing us to make a second set uh, for us to retain, so we have to have our own money for that. We're working with them to raise money for their set. And so, uh, as I said, there's no clear grant programs to, that conceived of this, because everything's towards digitization, just digitization, get it up on the web. What, you're going back to the physical world? Well, that's not really in our grant program. We haven't, that's not a category to apply for. This gives us the ability also to make repairs. 
So you see the original oyster catcher rattle in the top there. The Ahuna decided, well, that's not complete. So it's missing something. The educational value of it is not complete. Can you repair it digitally? So in the computer, they took the head from that rattle that you see here, digitally grafted it to that one, and we 3D printed a complete rattle. It requires erasing hair and opercula shell teeth inlays to prepare it, and then we'll use real human hair, real teeth, uh, or uh, opercula shell teeth. Yeah, you might see in some of the scenes there I had a ponytail. Well, my ponytail's been cut off so I can supply the hair for some of these replicas there. <laughs> so uh, so we need more, too, because I can't grow it fast enough. So uh, now, now the 3D printing is the best mode of reproduction for those types of objects because they're hollow, they have nooks and crannies, the laser can't see and the camera can't see because it needs a straight on view. So 3D printing is great for that. But there are other objects in that collection that are better for milling like the killer whale hat, like these masks, these dance wands. And here you see this is Chris Holschwander, who's our uh, uh, exhibits department milling specialist. So he milled that dance wand. And when I was in Huna for the repatriation, and touring around, we realized that they had a milling machine that they used for milling signs for the tourists on the cruise ships. And we realized it had the same capabilities as the milling machine in the Smithsonian. So uh, after Chris milled this dance wand, he sent the digital files to this gentleman, Donnie Dibdal in, in Huna, and he milled that dance wand out on his machine. He mailed it back to us and we put them side by side and they were identical. So from then on, we decided we will not mill anything else for Huna, they will mill their own. And the important point about this is when we first started doing this, people were saying, well, this is all fine and dandy, but only big museums, institutions, federal governments can afford to do this, or have the equipment or the funds to do this. Right away, we were showing that that's not true. Some communities may actually have some of this technology already in their, at their access uh, that's just not being used for this. They actually plan on buying a more sophisticated CNC milling machine to be able to do things like clan hats and other objects as well. So once everything is milled and... Uh, and, and duplicated, oh, I forgot, I was, I was a slide behind. I'm sorry, this is Donnie Dibdell with the, the uh, dance wand that he milled in Huna and sent to us. Once all the objects are 3D printed and milled, uh, Bob Starbird of Huna Indian Association said, we like what you did with the killer whale hat, but we have our own artists who can paint and do a shell inlays and can do hair uh, attachments. So just 3D print what you need to, 3D mill, or will 3D mill everything that's left, both, both sets, and then we'll send a team of artists to the Smithsonian to use the originals as a model and we'll finish painting them. The artists can put their own touch on them, can interpret to what degree, to what they need to repair or age it. Do you make it look like it looks on a shelf today or do you make it look like it was when it was fresh and used uh, when it was first made? So this is a collaboration, this is a stage that we're at now. We're, we're done 3D printing everything. They're in the process of getting a new milling machine to finish milling them, and we look forward to wrapping it up. Our next big project is the Sculpin Hat Replication Project. This hat is in our collections. It was collected in the late 1800s from Sitka. And Harold Jacobs, the repatriation representative for Central Council, Klingit and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska, son of Mark Jacobs, who received the killer whale hat back, um, Harold Jacobs came to the Smithsonian and found this broken hat in the collections and he recognized it as a sculpin uh, associated with the Kiksadi clan in Sitka. And you can see here the hat is badly broken, cracked in so several places, missing sections. And Harold, since he was so involved with us with the killer whale hat, he asked us, can you apply the same technology there? Can you digitize this, scan this hat, and then repair it in the computer and then 3D mill a new hat? And we said, yeah, we think we could do that. He said, if you do that, I think that the Klan would probably want to kill money on it and bring it out at Kuik and make it a Klan crest object once again. And uh, so he introduced us to the Klan leader and <clears throat> we talked about that. And he said, yeah, I, th I think we want to try to do that. As we were researching it, the hat, we found that it actually had another section that we didn't know about for the last hundred years. This stovepipe attachment, as it was called in the accession records, this, this potlatch cylinder, uh, was it's 22 inches long, it's huge. And this, this hat is already a really big hat. It's also broken and cracked in several places. So this hat, because it's so in such bad condition, they would not repatriate this for, they, they want objects they can put back into use to dance with and to put into service again. And they saw this 3D replication as a way that they could um, 
maybe uh, um, get around that. So we brought the Klan leader, uh, Ray Wilson Sr. Here you see in the center, uh, looking over the hat, we brought him down to consult on this project and he brought other Klan leaders with him, including Eagle Side Klan leaders because he want, he's on the Raven side, Frog Raven are his main crests. The Sculpin is one of their subcrests, and he wanted anything he said to be witnessed by his opposites and validated by his opposites. So he brought a Kaguantan clan leader, Andy Gamble, in the lower right there. Uh, he came to balance his words. And we consulted on the, the hat and studied it closely, and then with them present, we began to digitize it. And first, as, as they mentioned, uh, for this to be Atu, it's important that the opposites be involved in, it make, in its making. So they asked the Kaguantan clan leader to begin scanning it, and he scanned it, and they asked me to scan it because I was adopted by the Dakloedi, so I'm on the eagle side also. So they had eagles scan the hat, and then Ray took his turn here. And then we all turned it over to the digitization guys to make sure that they got it right. But the eagles scanned the hat. That was important to them. Now it's also important then, they realized when they were undertaking this, they wanted to follow cultural protocols as much as possible, just incorporate this new technology into traditional cultural protocols. They realized that a lot of the effort is gonna be in milling this hat. So they asked, who's gonna mill this hat? And I told them, Chris Halschwander would probably mill this hat. And they said, we wanna meet this guy <laughs> and uh, ask about his family and his lineage, who, where he comes from and things like that. They sat him down on the couch, we had all these cameras facing him, he had no idea what was coming. And uh, they interviewed him for a little while and then they said, well, the Kaguantan, the eagle side, have, have to uh, make this hat. If you're going to make this hat, you have to be on the eagle side. So the Kaguantan clan is going to adopt you. And, and his eyes went like that. And, uh, uh, and uh, a few days later at a, at a, a feast that we had uh, at the museum, they adopted him. So uh, then eagles will make the hat. We CT scanned the hat as well as, uh, that was a, this was a laser scanner here, structured light, uh, captures uh, color and structure. We also CT scanned it. Here we can see nails embedded in it. We can see holes in it. It had 175 holes in it. So we know the hat was refurbished several times and we can see the sequence of the repairs and the different paint jobs and the different things that were attached to it. So we learned a lot about this hat that we had not known for the last 100 years before the community asked for us to dive deeper into this collaboration together. Digitally, once it's in the computer, as we saw with the killer whale hat, you can put color on it, and then they began to digitally repair it. Here you see a patch being applied to join that gap uh, in, the, in the section of the rim, and the pilot cylinder, the cracks were joined, and the holes were patched, and they came up with digital models then that were solid, that were, uh, that were fixed. Here we see before and after. This allowed them to then be milled. And here is Chris, now newly minted Kaguantan, uh, milling the, the hat. It's not a fast process. <laughs> they mill a little bit, dry it a little bit, mill a little bit, just like the carvers. They carve a little bit, set it aside. It actually has to go in a freezer, so it's controlled and slow dry, and so it, it can take quite a while. But what's happening here is he is capturing and reproducing the original knife marks of the original artists, of what they carved, what they put on it. The clan asked that where there were holes in it, even if we decide not to put holes in it and attach in those areas, they wanted the little divots left there where there were holes. So when it's milled, it has those traces on it. So the replica hat has the, the marks that, that uh, allude to the past generations of what they had done to it in different iterations of the hat. They were closely involved in every stage of the process and consultation was, um, was active all the time. Here we're Skyping with them to where they're watching it being milled in process and commenting on it. And you should have seen Ray's face light up when, uh, when he saw this in action, seeing that it's making it a reality. They agreed to allow us to make a second uh, hat for the museum to retain that looks just like what they made. So we can help tell the story of what we made for them, what we helped them make together. And so we're making two hats. One is uh, made of alder. The original was made of cedar and you saw how it broke. It's light wood, it broke. They think that uh, 
their ancestors made a mistake in making it out of that wood. Uh, so they chose to make it out of alder, a stronger, heavier wood. And they cut alders in Juneau and sent them to us. The museum's copy would make out of cedar because we don't intend for it to be danced and brought out in ceremony. So it can sit there and just help us tell the story. But it, it, can, uh, it doesn't need to be alder. We consulted on the design of the paint and the attachments that went on it. And then they sent a, a clan leader from the Deshutan clan, Joe Zuboff, was sent to us as an advisor to oversee our finishing stages of it, where we were attaching straps and leather to it and painting it. Because again, the eagles finish the hat. The eagles have to paint the hat. So he's a Deshutan Ravenside, but he's an artist and they trust him. And uh, he was there to mentor us and to teach us. And they decided not to make it look exactly like the original that uh, to make it, to bridge it a little bit, to found, uh, to anchor the elements of the, the new hat in the original, but to accent it with their own uh, take on it. So some of the colors they chose were more similar to the hats they use today, the green over the blue, the shell inlays and the eyes. They felt like they would have done that if they could have. There were actually circles cut into the eyes as if they one day intended to put shell or copper in there, but maybe weren't able to get to it. Maybe they couldn't afford it. So they put shell in the eyes of these hats. Garfield George, another Deshutan clan leader who came down to uh, advise us. So it was a very much steeped as much as possible in traditional culture combined with the high tech 21st century uh, technology being applied to uh, make this project possible. Here they are attaching the leather. Here are the original and uh, nearly finished hats are side by side. Cook City clan members killed the deer for the deer hide that's attached to it. We know there was ermine skin attached to it. We had our mammals people identify the proteins of tiny fragments of, of, uh, pro, of uh, leather that was still attached to it. The, the uh, swan down, that, that was the top of it. Our birds division people identified the swan, the hair of swan, or the feathers of swan, and so we used spruce sap to attach that swan on there. So we brought forward as much as we could. So this is probably now the most studied Klingit object in our collections. <laughs> we know this inside and out. Uh, we identified the loose hairs that were attached to it, that were stuck in the paint on it and things like that. And so we know a lot about this and it, it informed them on the decisions about to what stage to return, to restore it to. Only during the consultation process did they point out that, hey, it might've had teeth, look closer there. And we got real close and looked under there. We found remnants of opercula shell teeth that were up in there. So, uh, so we did uh, re-inlay uh, re opercula shell teeth. We believe it had sea lion whiskers all across the back of it, rows of them that were taken out and then painted over. So to which life, to which form do we restore it to? So they decided to do combinations of those, to put some sea lion whiskers on it, to harken back to that original generation of it, but they think they were taken off and then an apron or something draped across the back like that. So here you see, a, and I should have mentioned earlier, this is a sculpin. A sculpin is a, a bullhead fish. It's a very ugly fish. <laughs> there, there's something like 260 species of them in Alaskan waters alone. Um, but several clans claim sculpin as their, as their crest, but only the Kiksiti in Sitka do. So this is where we're at now. Uh, they intend, uh, when the time is right, when they hold a, a ceremony in Alaska, to have us bring the original hat that you see here, their hat, the alder hat, uh, both to Alaska for ceremony. And then in ceremony, they will transfer the spirit from the original broken hat into this new hat. It will be brought out and witnessed by the opposites. It will become Atu. This will no longer be a replica. It will not be a reproduction. It will be the hat. Uh, so uh, the original will remain in our collections as a what they said, a shell that used to hold the, the spirit for it. So in this case, our previous cases we talked about were we repatriated the objects and then the communities allowed us to make 3D du duplicates. In this case, they're not repatriating it. This is a form of cultural restoration. There's no word for this. This isn't repatriation. This is a form of cultural restoration uh, that is with 3D digital assistance. Our next project is uh, 3D 
spear throwers, this clinket spear throwers. These are very rare. There were only about a dozen known in museums at the time that we began this project, and they were so intricately carved and so short that many artists uh, or many uh, researchers felt that these were shamanic objects, that they may never have been used for spear throwers. And uh, um, we decided to put that to the test by 3D replicating them. They use this, if you've never seen one of these before, it's kind of like a, a, a spear thrower. Some people call them the atlatls, the Aztec word. The Klingit word is, is shi'an, and uh, they're used to launch the spear. The butt end of the spear rests here, as you see this gentleman there, and when he throws forward, it adds a joint to the arm, and it adds the thrust, the distance and the force that they can, that they can throw it with. And consulting with... Uh, Harold Jacobs of the Central Council, again, he helped us to uh, uh, pursue this project. So we 3D replicated two of them in our collections. And um, we went outside and we started throwing spears. <laughs> and we, uh, we proved that these could work. These are printed in a high strength nylon, so they're very tough. So it could bounce this off the wall and nothing would happen, it'd be all right. It wouldn't shatter like this one would. And uh, so it can take the force uh, as the original wood would. And then we took it to Alaska uh, to a Klan conference and we threw spears with Klingit Klan leaders and with students and, and Klingit researchers and for several days uh, had workshops out there and just let them throw spears with their, uh, um, their traditional technology. The goal with this project is to reintroduce this technology. Uh, there are Yupik and Inupiat kids that hunt with spear throwers, hunt seals and otters with them in the summer. They still do it as a tradition. The Klingit have essentially forgotten this as an art. We, through our research, we found there's about another dozen, there's about 25, 26 that are known in museums around the world, but they're all in museums, none are in Klingit hands. And so now the Klingit recognize that this is part of their traditional culture, and um, we are making the 3D files available through Central Council to uh, to teach with and to make 3D prints so they can give them out to culture camps and the kids can actually start throwing with these 3D prints. There are now Klingit carvers that are making these and plan to hunt with them. So I uh, just wanted to demonstrate, we'll, uh, we'll throw a spear at a target at the back of the room there. <laughs> and that then, this does raise that issue. You don't have that with a normal digital product. It's just on the internet. Well now people are going back to the physical, so what do you do? So our general counsel's office said, you can't just give anybody the ability to make 3D prints. They'll be like you, Eric, and spear their little brother when you were, when you were little. I, I did try to spear my little brother with a spear, and this would have made it a lot easier. So we didn't want to be liable for facilitating that. So they made us create a use right agreement that uh, the Klingit will have access to these files. They can have 3D prints made of them, but they are then responsible for making sure, we're not liable, they're responsible for making sure that if they give them out at culture camps, they will follow appropriate safety education and protocols and you know, kind of like archery. I mean, they teach archery in high schools and schools all over the place, right? It's why aren't they teaching spear throwing? This is, all of our ancestors hunted with these for tens of thousands of years before the bow and arrow. So this is a lost art for all of us. You should try it sometime. Come to the Smithsonian and we'll throw spears over lunch. <laughs> so this is, again, these are not objects that would fit repatriation categories. They're not a funerary object, they're not a sacred object, they are a tool, a hunting tool. And the Klingit don't like us to say weapons because then it's like you know, 3D printing guns. These are a tool. And uh, um, so again, a new form of cultural restoration aided by the 3D digital technology. We're gonna restore hunting with these to the Klingit again. I mentioned the Klan conference. At Klan conference, we took teams of, uh, of people from the Smithsonian and equipment to the Klan conference and the Klan leaders brought us out hats in their possession uh, to have them digitized and then archive those files for safety and security in case something happens to it. They saw what could be done with the killer whale hat. We could make one, we could use those, or they could be handed to a carver to be used as an aid for them in carving it. It's whatever they deem appropriate. And some clan leaders are even asking, could we make a duplicate hat for them? Could they make a brother hat? In this case, Ray Dennis felt like he would like to have a black raven hat. Uh, that he would bring out at Kuwait and have witnessed by opposites. And again, none of these are uh, things that we would have ever imagined that they would consider or be interested in, but it's now our responsibility to share the capabilities of this technology with them and let them decide what's culturally appropriate for their specific cases, whether it's clan by clan, house by house, tribe by tribe, government by government, uh, community by community, what they decide is appropriate. 
The Caddo Nation is a good example of this. They have sent teams working with Sam Austin University. They've sent teams around to lots of museums that have Caddo funerary objects. And they 3D scan them, and they put hundreds of them up on the web and allow the public to 3D print them. They don't put color files or, or texture files on them. That's where they drew the line. So it's not quite there, but it's pretty darn close. I never would have thought that they would decide to do that. So again, tribe by tribe, government by government, they will decide where this technology leads us. And it's a new domain for tribes and museums. Ray Wilson said that uh, this is not so much about getting a hat back with the Sculpt and Hat Project. It's about demonstrating for indigenous communities and museums what the possibilities are when they work together and collaborate. Gunak Shish. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one I'm curious about is you, you told the story about the man who operated the CNC machine being adopted by the Eagle Wolf uh -huh. clan. And I'm wondering, did he, was part of that process learning the stories and legends around the specific object? I forget the name of the, the, the fish head that the, the hat sculpin. Was, the sculpin. The uh sculpin. -huh. I mean, did, did, did some of that, did he have to do his research to learn the significance of it to be part of that? No. Okay. It, it's not, uh, it's not his story. It's the Kiksadi's story. They have to know that story. Even if he knew the story, he's not allowed to tell it without their permission. So it's not, he's, he's performing a service for them. He's making it for them. And when they bring it out at Kawik, they, they pay off the opposites. They, um, they'll honor them. They, they may um, present him with something in, in return and recognition for his service to them. But at Eagles, it's their duty to do it. They don't know that. You're responsible for your own side's stuff, but you aid the other, the other side. When I was adopted, I didn't know I was going to be adopted. I was at a Mark's Memorial Potlatch. I was actually helping serve food because all of the Dakla AD, they were hosting it. They were called up to the front and they stood for six hours. So there was no one to serve the food and cook the food. So I was helping along with some relatives and other people who were not adopted by one side or the other. So you're either sitting in the audience as a host or you're there as the, as the um, or, or you're standing as a host and you're sitting there as a guest. And, uh, and they called me up to the front there and they adopted me and gave me a name along with other, other names. And that was it. I was, uh, I'm, I'm part of that community from then on. So they don't, uh, there's not a lot of training or initiation <laughs> or, uh, or even forewarning in some, some cases. Some people know for years that they're going to receive a name. Uh, a lot of museum people, just by working with the Klingit over time, they end up getting adopted into one community or another. They like to be able to place you uh, in their social system. The Navy, when they took over Alaska in the 1860s from the Russians, Navy administered Alaska for many years. The Klingit immediately recognized them as eagles because they wore an eagle crest on their hats. So you came in, you sat with the eagle side. So there's no, they didn't teach them how to be an eagle. <laughs> they already were. But your second question? Um, yeah, my second question is, it seemed like with a lot of these examples that a common theme seems to be that 3D scanning and 3D printing seems to be more acceptable to various cultures than photography. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if that has to do, if you think that has to do with the nature of, you know, the way the measurements and imaging are made or if it has to do with the technology being newer and maybe having less historical baggage. That's an interesting point, but it's, it's, it's not true for the majority of what you've seen because you saw the Klingit there and you saw that photograph from 1900. They were embracing the technology of photography to aid in witnessing and commemorating things. They do audio recordings of their ceremonies and songs all the time. They share pictures and video all the time. They, they document the heck out of everything. And so it's good because they are continually going back to these recordings and they're using those photographs to help them in repatriation claims. Those, that photograph of that uh, clan leader lying in state, that helped them claim that killer well dagger on him that hat that was next to him, they used that to assert this was ours and this is how we used it, <laughs> so can't argue with that. So the Klingit were very much embraced photography and all forms of documentary uh, technology because it's another form of witnessing. It helps legitimize that it happened and be a witness to it. But other communities like the Delaware, they're not so much uh, keen on photography as I mentioned. 
they didn't want photographs at the repatriation ceremonies and things like that. And, and uh, there was re signing at the signing, yes, but not when they were being uh, put in the ground and things like that. Maybe don't want photographs of human remains. But it's an interesting point because I have had tribes say they didn't want photographs of the objects, uh, uh, but could they have a 3D print of one? We even had a tribe say that uh, we don't want to show uh, images of human remains, but could they 3D scan and print a vertebra with the arrowhead embedded in it? Because they could take that into schools and they could teach about the violence in their past and their valley and how they fought for it. It would make it more real to the students to teach that. But they were against photography of remains. But they, but they didn't pursue that, but they talked about it, they contemplated it. So perhaps it is something where they see it as a bit different from the photography and what their issues were with, uh, with concerns about photography. It's tribe by tribe, group by group, uh, we're finding. We're not making any assumptions anymore about what they will or won't consider to be appropriate. We want to hear it from them. Has the very kind of personal nature of NAGPRA and dealing with living tribes and living communities kind of colored this in a specific way that you think might affect how it's reproduced, um, where, for instance, there might not be direct living communities for the objects which are being requested, or how might, do you think it's an analogous situation? If not, what's different and how might it change? Uh, that's a, I think that's a complex question. Uh, even under NAGPRA in the US, this is not being done. This, as far as we know, we're the only museum in the in the country, maybe the world that's doing this, that's, that's making uh, 3D replicas of repatriation related objects at the request of tribes. Now we have heard that there are tribes that are getting objects back through repatriation, and then they're taking them to their local university and having them 3D scan them and 3D print them. Uh, and we know of tribes that are now investing, they've come and seen this, and they're investing in uh, cameras to do photogrammetry and the software, Agisoft, to uh, be able to process files themselves because their elders have said the same thing. We, they want to get the objects back, they want to rebury them, but they don't want to lose the educational value and the value to teach about their material culture by doing that. So they want to salvage something through 3D tech, but it's just getting started. So this is not the norm under NAGPRA, and uh, it remains to be seen how many tribes will embrace this as something that is uh, okay with them and, and positive with them. So when, when you say, is this the norm here versus, uh, now repatriation in general, uh, other places where they might not have the same in, the indigenous communities in the, uh, undertaking the same kind of approaches to repatriation. Um, I don't know how that's that different because repatriation is always being pursued by contemporary communities. Um, where there are those connections are those communities that assert those connections, whether they're agreed to or not by the museums. So as long as there are, in a sense, stakeholders, for lack of a better term, whether it's through repatriation, cultural affiliation kind of context, or people who feel they have a connection to it, this offers an opportunity for them, for the museum community and for those communities, indigenous communities, to explore are, is there middle ground? Because under the NAGPRA, people have come to feel that it's either all in or it's all out. Either it all stays in the museum and maybe the tribes don't have access. Unless they come to visit, maybe they'll send them some pictures. But otherwise, that's, that's staying here. Or it's, it's all out. It leaves the museum. Uh, it's reburied. It's destroyed. Sometimes uh, thrown in a lake or burned in a fire. But it's inaccessible for study, even by the community themselves. It creates a, a duality that isn't really there. It doesn't have to be there. Uh, and it depends on what the, but a lot of us are being taught it must be reburied. NAGPRA is about reburial. It used to be called the reburial movement, not anymore. Repatriation is about the right of these indigenous communities to assert their control over the objects. We can repatriate without something even leaving the museum. If they're comfortable with it staying in the museum, what level of access do they want? What level of control do they want to exercise over it? That's as complete and a legitimate a repatriation as them taking it back and burying it in the ground and it's never uh, seen again by anybody. Um, so it's, I, I think it's, it's a complex uh, question and uh, I think this offers a lot of opportunities. Uh, we'll see where they take it. Now in Europe, they're way ahead of us with 3D scanning and archeology span and, and digitization. They do it all just as a matter of habit. If you go to a site, you're gonna scan it <laughs> and uh, you're gonna fly drones over it and and uh, model it from the top, you're gonna reconstruct it digitally. So they're ahead of us as they have been in geophysics and ground penetrating radar and things like that. They already have been doing it. How they apply it for past communities, they're, they're certainly doing it in documenting sites in Iraq, Palmyra and other places like that. They're scanning as fast as they can uh, to try to uh, help uh, document sites at risk. 
So that's where it's really being used, I think, in a lot of other countries. But I think as more communities hear about what we're doing with it, they'll decide for themselves how they want to apply it. And we'll see a lot of new ways that we never would have thought about before. And this is why I think it's too early to theorize about this as an approach. There's people already wanting to write about it and theorize it and looking over our shoulders at what we're doing, how we're doing it, and wanting to talk about that and package it in theory. And we're just like, we don't know what the next tribe is going to ask. This is too early. This is too, we don't want to recommend policies to constrain who has uh, ability to do what or with it, how, how do we control the files. We've heard that they definitely want some say over how the files are accessible. This is not that different from 3D casting that's been being done by museums since the 1800s. They cast and they duplicate and they exchange them with other museums, things like that. It's not that different, except this can go on the internet and you have no idea who's downloading it. You have no idea how they might be utilizing it. So that's the big fear. That's, uh, could they be commercializing it and then sa selling it, mass producing it, things like that. That's the big uh, concern that everybody has. How do we limit that? Thank you so much for your great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about um, the um, objects that are uh, replicated to be used and how that affects um, decisions you make in relation to authenticity, especially around things like paints that have mercury in and whether you're switching out for safer materials. Um, but I was also interested in the longevity of these objects if they're being used and whether you're working with the tribes for a plan to replace objects as they get worn out if they're used a lot or how you're thinking about that kind of question. That's a little early for us to think about that, but it, it, it has come up. And with the sculpt hat, as you see, they're learning from what they felt were mistakes or inadequacies of the original. And so they were already wanting to make improvements on it and build on it. The Klingit traditionally have replaced hats. If a hat worn out or got destroyed in uh, the village of Huna burned in 1944 and they lost all except two hats. And so they had uh, carvers try to make from uh, old photographs or from their own memory, replace those hats. So they already had a tradition of uh, replacing hats and rest restoring them and duplicating them in that way. This is just a new tool applied to it. These Klingit artists tell us, our ancestors weren't stupid. If they had access to a chainsaw, they'd be using a chainsaw. So when they got a chainsaw, they used a chainsaw. And the, the, the steel knives, they used steel knives as soon as they got them and replaced the stone knives that they were working on. And so they see this, just like a chainsaw, this is just another tool uh, to be incorporated in, in their, their ways of doing things. Now the 3D prints, we're not so sure how they will change over time because the technology is, is still new. Will they shrink a little bit? Will they uh, become more friable? Uh, depends on the medium. You know, I think there's still research going on into that about uh, uh, what can happen with those. Now you can 3D print in metal, you can 3D print in plastic, chocolate, sugar, you can, you can do it in a lot of different medium, but uh, again, how those media behave, it's, uh, well, is it this nylon, that's a plastic. So they know a lot about how plastics behave. The gypsum powder with the bonding agent there, not quite sure, will it, will it move a little bit over time? We have the option of going back and making another one if, uh, <laughs> if, if, if we need to in, in, in that sense. Um, so you, you see, it definitely are some things that, that need to be explored for the future. And those that are put into use, they'll have wear and tear on them, they might break. Uh, we've been throwing spears with these for a while, little kids have thrown with them and dropped them, and they tend to fly out of your hand if you don't hold them right <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and, and bounce uh, across the field or things like that. And if they, if they break, then that's, uh, if we made one out of wood, we'd have the same issues. Thank you. Thank you. Behind you there. Thank you so much for sharing this amazing work with us. Um, I'm wondering, how do you determine which cultural restoration projects you take on, since they do require such investment and time and care uh, and collaboration? And then also, you mentioned it's a little bit too early to begin theorizing this process, um, but are you all disseminating uh, this possibility with other tribes and communities um, to see if they're interested since it is still so new um, and another way of engaging. Yeah. We share this with everybody that comes to visit the museum and we have pictures of this on the wall of the hallway going down the uh, um, along with other scenes from our repatriation activities uh, at our collections center. So anytime a tribe comes to consult, we share with them everything that we do as well as all the collections and records that we have available. We share with them what other tribes have decided to do before them and what they deemed appropriate. And you can see the, 
their minds opening up for, well, this might be appropriate for this circumstance or that circumstance, or a tribe might say, it's like, well, we would never consider that. That's not, that's not for us. It's okay for them. It's not for us. And going, so we, we do, we, we try to make it as available. We are, um, the killer whale hat is on the web. Uh, the sculpin hat story, when it comes out in Alaska and is finished with its story, they'll allow it to go up on the web and they'll allow press uh, to go up. This is one reason why we're not, rec we are recording this, but the clan leaders will decide when they want it to go up on the web as far as, because that sculpin hat story is not finished until it comes out at Kuik and is, and is finished. Then they're fine with it being told, um, and, and out there. We have published an uh, article in Museum Anthropology Review that talks about some of these collaborations and the start of some of these. Didn't have the, the spear throwers of the Sculpin Hat project in it, and that goes into more cultural detail if you're interested in that. So we are trying to disseminate it. Uh, this is a little challenging in the repatriation office because people are having trouble see how this is repatriation because we already did the repatriations in some cases, then they want a 3D replicate. Well, this isn't, you already gave them back. That's not. Why should we fund that? Why should you spend your time on that? You should only spend your time responding to additional claims, writing reports, assessments, consulting. And so it's, it's a new domain that we're trying to wrap our heads around. We don't spend much repatriation money on this. We actually had to seek grants uh, for outside money and some internal Smithsonian money. And, and I definitely need to acknowledge the Smithsonian Women's Committee provided a lot of money for the milling of that hat. And the Women's Committee will probably be present at the Kuik when it comes out. They'll come and witness it being finished, uh, see how their money was, was utilized. <laughs> and they're very excited about this project. They met the Klingit when they came and worked on this and get to participate uh, in that way. But it is a challenge to uh, find the funds to do this because it can be an expensive process. It can be time consuming. And there's not a clear fit for it. It's not, there's lots of grants for digitization with the goal is to get it up on the web and make it accessible to people. Some of this will not be accessible to people. <laughs> There's, we're digitizing things, uh, funerary objects for the Aleutians right now that we intend to put up with a link that only the Aleut, only the Anungan will have access to that link. They will decide who can link that and they can see the objects in three, turn them upside down. These are masks found in caves that are funerary objects for them. They can study them. Artists can study the ethnographic objects in our collections, but they will decide who sees that and it won't be for the rest of the world to see that. And so we have to make decisions about uh, do we spend time and effort and money supporting that when the rest of the world's not gonna get to see it? So we, we do have to make some, it, it can be a challenge. How do we spend time on that? But any tribe that is approaching us, if we can try to help them, we'll try to help them. In these cases, they've, they've said, let's go ahead, let's do it, we work together. In some cases, they found some funding to help support it. Others are, others have come and said, we like this, we're gonna go home and do this ourselves, thank you very much. And, uh, and I don't know what they're doing. Uh, I'd love to learn what they're doing and they feel like they're capable of doing it. We're interested in internships, tribes sending uh, students to come and be trained by the digitization program because they can't do this for us. They do this for the entire Smithsonian. So they no longer wanna help us. Uh, they'll train us and they'll loan us equipment but they can't send people anymore. So we're having to now, repatriation offices, buying our own computers, our own software, to try to learn how to do this as much ourselves as possible, and hopefully host tribes so they can learn it and begin doing it themselves on their own material culture. We wanna make clear that it removes it from our hands, uh, and we just wanna facilitate. Thank you. In communities I've worked in, there's always a lot of disagreement, and even about what counts as someone who's in a tribe or not in a tribe. So if someone comes in and says, I'm Crow and I want to do this, do you say, no, you have to go back and get permission from some group? Does it have to go through the cultural committee in order to do that? Um, and if a group outside of the cultural committee wants to do something, like, is there some point where you feel like you have to make a decision? I guess I'm interested in, because it's not always seamless these, within a community about yeah. what should happen. Yeah. Who has the authority to speak for these decisions in the community uh, is always a challenge. And in the repatriation business, we, we're required to do a government-to-government -government relationship. Uh, and so those governmental entities, if they speak for that governmental entity, we deal with them. Now, they deal with their, their own constituency then, as far as their cultural advisors, their committees, things like that, their elders that they have to confer with. But the authorization is just like an authorization to sign for receipt of repatriation. It lies with the officials of those governments. With the clans, uh, they are kind of sub-entities within uh, those tribal governments. And, but it's to those clans that those objects were Atu, not to the larger Klingit community as a whole. That killer whale hat is the killer whale hat of the Dakloedi clan. Only the Dakloedi have say over what happens to it when it's brought out, 
things like that. So that clan leader, that caretaker, if they're acknowledged caretakers and clan leaders for it, then we can work with them and they can approve this. They have to be concerned about what their house leaders and other members of the community think about what they're doing. And when we first took that hat to Alaska in uh, 2012, when Edwell first uh, was unveiled for him, he actually asked a raven to, to pull the cloth off of it. So he doesn't do it himself. See, even that act, even though it was not ought to, he was behaving towards it in, with the uh, cultural protocols. He was a little uncertain about how it would be received by others in the Klingit community. And we were there for four days uh, scanning objects so they could see what we were doing and understand it and, and remove the mystery around it. If we went and presented for an hour, this is what we did, uh, thank you very much, there would be much speculation, much concerns, much uh, um, rumors about what we're doing. Clinket uh, artists were texting each other, Smithsonian's going to put us out of business, you need to come and see this technology because we're not going to have a job anymore. And then after four days, the Clinket carvers were coming in there with the scanners and scanning the objects with us and saying, this is just another tool you know, and, and uh, it's not a problem, not a threat. So that's a concern, but it's a concern that it, as with any uh, context, as a context you've been dealing with probably too, you have to they have to navigate some of that themselves, and then we have to make sure we're dealing with appropriate authorities that have the authority to authorize some of this work. So uh, just anybody from the Klingit community coming in, I want a replica of that hat, we're not gonna do that, <laughs> and, uh, just because they might want one. Um, and there's not always agreement about who is the uh, clan leader. That, that is just like in repatriation, that can be a real um, showstopper for being able to move ahead with something. Thank you. Thank you.